Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. The book, The Republican War Against Women, was printed first in 1996. Sadly, 20 years later, that war has intensified. And shockingly, many of its leaders then are still names we know now. Its author, Tanya Milish, is my guest today. Hi, Ronnie. Hi. It's too relevant. It's unbelievable how relevant it is today. How can that be? I guess one of the reasons is that uh, the Electoral College provides for minority points of view, and I mean minor not minority in the sense of people of color, but minority people who don't represent all of the country to get elected. We had the same thing in 2000, mm -hmm. Gore v. Bush. Mm -hmm. And this then invigorates the people in the Republican Party that my colleagues and I fought against all those years because they say, look, George W. Bush won, George Herbert Walker Bush won, and yes, the women of America generally uh, voted for the Democrats, but white married women voted for George Herbert Walker Bush, George W. Bush, and for Trump. So that's how it happened. Let me tell a little bit about you. Okay. That you come from Utah. Your father was the Speaker of the House. No, State Senate. State Senate. Um, your grandfather was a friend of Herbert Hoot. Right. Your f whole family was Republican. Right. But they well, were from the old liberal kind of mellow Republican Party. I wouldn't even say it was liberal. My, no. my father considered himself a conservative in the old sense of the word. However, he also supported uh, rights for uh, people of color. He supported the ERA. So in that sense, in the cultural sense, he was a liberal. But in my sense, as a Democrat looking on, word. <laughs> he was liberal, like Rockefeller, like whatever. Ha I mean, Robert Taft would never have let what is happening now happen, right? That's right. And my he was father was a Taft delegate in the 52. So you grew up in a Republican family, and you were a strong Republican supporter. Yes. Believing in the things your father believed in. Yes. Which, to me, were liberal, social liberal things. Conservative fiscally, but other way. Anyway, so then along comes at some point in your career, because you stayed in politics. I think you, like me, were born with this political love, basically. Yes. Right? Yes. yes. And um, you went to conventions, and you were delegate. You were an alternate. You worked on platform stuff and everything. So the war, when did it start? I think it started with Roe v. Wade. Do you really? Didn't I it do. start earlier? It was a different kind because there really wasn't a women's movement. If you go way oh. back, if you go back to the Gold. 20s, you go back to the suffrage era, yeah. it was the Republican women who were, the, who, were, who were the feminists. And the abolitionists. And so. Absolutely. Yeah. And they were and, betrayed, weren't they, by the yes, abolitionists? Yes, they were betrayed. Right. Uh, unfortunately, there, this seems to be what happens. And then mm -hmm. along came, as I mentioned earlier, Hoover and Landon were uh, the liberal wing of the Republican Party. You know, that's difficult to tell an FDR but Democrat, think, right. but it was, yeah. it was true in terms of that. So what happened is that along came uh, FDR, the sweep of, of the Democratic Party, dominating the country for a very long time. Uh, the Taft wing, the very conservative wing of the party, uh, dominated all through to 52 when Dwight Eisenhower was elected. Dwight Eisenhower, the Republican, was elected. And at that time, there was support for women. The first woman, uh, Ovita Kulp Hobby, was uh, part of Ike's uh, cabinet. Women were supported by the Republican Party. Was, uh, part of it was because Ike had uh, good, he liked women in the military. In, Right. The experience of World War II. So we move forward to 56. Ike is reelected. There is a vital uh, women's movement within the Republican Party. I wouldn't call it quite feminist, but, but there was a, a desire to see women run for office. There was a support system. So we move now into 60. Nixon versus Kennedy. John F. Kennedy. Nixon again had women working on his campaign up at the top. And, uh, 
There were women running campaigns in the state, Republican Party. But he had run a vicious campaign oh, against uh, Ellen Gahagan Douglas. Of course, of yeah. course. Yeah. But uh, they the would Senate. justify that, that right. she was right. too left-wing. Right. So that was ideology. Yeah. The, so there was a, there was a foundation yeah. for women ex to yeah. run for office. Yeah. So then we get to 1964, and this is the beginning of the change of the Republican Party's historic treatment of, of but, wanting women. Right, but historic, I mean, just historically now, aside from women, how the conservatives began to gain power. That's right. Historians say, really, it started with um, the Goldwater or Nixon wanting to, I don't, I've got the years, but courting of the Southern Democrats no, well, well, this, as it comes after 64? Southern strategy came out of an, an analysis of how the, the conser far right conservatives could take over the Republican Party. And after Kennedy beat Nixon in 60, then Bill Rusher from the National Review and uh, Cliff White developed the Southern strategy. The Southern strategy was we can, and the, and the civil rights movement was starting then, we can take over not only the country, but the Republican Party and get rid of those people who uh, pay too much attention to uh, rights for women and rights for people of color. So 64 comes, there is a big fight at the convention in San Francisco. Uh, Nelson Rockefeller, our, our governor, was one of the candidates. Um, Barry Goldwater wins, and the Southern strategy is then attempted against LBJ. The country supports LBJ. I'm interested in what happened to white married women. Two times women voted overwhelmingly for the Democratic candidate in recent years. Guess mm -hmm. what year? 64. And the other one is 96 with Bill Clinton. Isn't that interesting? So then comes the movement toward the takeover of the Republican Party. And uh, my colleagues, we were on the other side. And we fought very hard uh, through 68. Nixon is the nominee. Uh, Nixon then becomes a, a nominee in 72. And then we have Watergate, and everything falls apart. And Jerry Ford, with his wonderful feminist wife, Betty, supports the work that we are doing. So there's a hiatus of a couple years where we are fighting for the ERA. We, Roe v. Wade comes along then, and we developed a Republican women's movement. And because he's been in the news recently, two of the people who were assigned to destroy our movement were Roger Stone and Paul Manafort. It's so it was incredible. All isn't the it? way back to the 72 campaign when they were young Republicans and we were on the other side. We, mainly Republican women and some men. Why did they do that? Was it strictly strategy? I mean, does principle occur to any of them? The principle is power and money. <laughs> and you've seen that, you've, we all know what has right. happened. To these when two did men. the evangelicals come in? They come in a little bit later. The, the idea was that there was a, an opportunity to take advantage of the backlash of whites in the South and move those white Democrats into the Republican Party. And, and while some didn't want, some of the leaders didn't want the party to be looked on as being anti-civil rights, it was becoming that way. And secondly, we had a lot of bigots up in the North. And the strategy was to win the White House. This is moving toward the election of Reagan in 1980, was to win some of the Southern states that had been very strongly Democratic, of some of the Northern states. Michigan, and you remember the Reagan Democrats? There was a, there was a. Right, yeah, I think, uh -huh. yeah. The charming man that he was, right? That's right. A great communicator. And that had started earlier with Nixon. But the Southern strategy ideas, mm. when Nixon was, that became the nominee in 68, that's when the Southern strategy was developed and then was used to win in 72 against George McGovern. Mm. I remember that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we had, um, what happened with Reagan? Well, 
Jimmy Carter, as people, I believe, assumed because he was a Southerner that he could win the Southern states. Uh, the Southern strategy was about racism and also about misogyny. So you, at that point, there was the big fat fight over the ERA, and Reagan took a position that was, we had a fight at the 80 convention. We tried, we, the Republican feminists, to get a plank that was a big tent plank for the ERA. We've got something, but what we did get, and I don't know whether I told you this, we met with, I didn't, I was working outside, but uh, some of the Republican women, Peggy Heckler, who was a Massachusetts Congresswoman, and a few others, met with Reagan. I think Jimmy Baker was in the room, and the agreement was that if Reagan won, he would appoint a woman to the Supreme Court. And they made that promise. And in exchange, we were to back up. We would get an ERA statement, but we would not get what we wanted. And when uh, the opening came, very early after Reagan was uh, president, very early, I th he's elected in 1980, I think 81, Sandra Day O'Connor is selected to be mm. the, the Supreme Court nominee. And, and we, our little group, remembering that, contacted the people we knew within the White House to remind them that, and there was a press release, you could go back mm -hmm. and find this, and they said, yes, we will appoint a woman to the Supreme Court. Okay. So Sandra Day and our little group were the beginning of what became many, many others. Next mm -hmm. was Ruth Bader Ginsburg, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. I remember meeting you, I think, in the 84 convention, Republican convention, in Houston, was that? I don't know. 92. 92. 92. Bush. Yeah, I kept all the years. That's all right. You're a Democrat. By this time, you <laughs> were really angry. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. So um, that's when they started really coming in to affect the platform with the issues of women's reproductive health and the ERA, right? Well, we had been fighting it since 72. Yeah, I, I know. Mean, we, we got double-crossed all the time. Yeah. Nixon told some of But you stayed of, in there fighting. That's right. We fought 72. We tried to do something in 76. The problem, you may remember, as New Yorkers, the governor, uh, Nelson Rockefeller, was the vice president. And uh, the right, you were asking about the evangel, the, the right-wing religious right was just beginning to move in. And uh, <sighs> Jerry Ford instead of picking Alan Simpson, a, a senator from Wyoming, to be his vice president, because he had to dump this New Yorker, Nelson Rockefeller, picked Bob Dole, who was the candidate of the religious right. So that's the beginning of the change. And the reason that the religious right piece is important, that's when the abortion issue becomes, begins to become it. an issue. I see, and it's now still is. Well, no, the Republican Party is completely anti-choice. Right. But people like you have left the party. I left a long time ago. Mm. I, I, what happened at the 92 convention, I was a delegate for H.W. President H.W. Bush from Manhattan, and I looked up and saw Barbara Bush sitting in the president's box with Jerry Falwell, and I thought, oh, this is not my party. I don't belong here. So I turned in my credentials to Senator Roy Goodman, who was the head of the Republican Party in Manhattan, and I left. It's amazing. And then two years later, I wrote this book. Three years. Yeah. And now, what do you think? <laughs> well, do you I think thought, there's going to be a th another Republican Party back. Oh, there has to be, uh, Ronnie. There has to be. Uh, the other possibility would be a split within the Democratic Party. We, we are not a country that has, is a one-party country. I mean, a one-party right, We right. are not going to be. Right. But are you, I mean, what's happened? I mean, what is the base? Why are some of the members of the Senate who we used to think were sensible people, why have they not? Are you talking about the U.S. Senate or yeah, the state Senate? the U.S. Senate. <laughs> are there any people there who well, represent I, the old party? I don't think so. Lamar Alexander? Well, he's, he's retiring. Right. He, he, he's uh, trying to uh, protect uh, 
Obamacare right now. You know, they're, they're there, but the fact of the matter is that the Republican Party is the party of Donald Trump. And they are preparing to run in 2020, and there is already a campaign staff in place. And as with any president, an incumbent president, the people in the party are told that we are getting ready to re for re-election. So you don't, you as a good party member, this happens with the Democrats too, uh, you don't stand up and take on the White House a year before a big election. So in the case of the Senate... But they've done it since the beginning. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I, I want to, I brought these pieces of paper because I wanted to say something about why. I've talked about the history of the Republican Party and how supportive it was even through Nixon and superficially, superficially in those early years of Reagan. I don't have, I was, we were fighting the choice issue, but there were attempts to do equal pay for equal work. There, there was an attempt to try to uh, say, we in the Reagan administration support women, we just don't agree with them on several issues. There were women appointed to the cabinet. Uh, Mrs. Dole is a good example of that. There's always been people in the Republican Party to show that they support women, but not women like me. <laughs> so as that's been happening, the women's movement, the women's political movement, has been out organizing, finding women to run for the state legislature, finding women to run for governor, to run for Senate. And in the early days, I was part of a movement where we wanted to elect Republican women and the Democrats wanted to elect Democratic women. And Known we, as the National Women's Political Caucus. And the Center for you were American one of the, Women yeah. in Politics, right. which has become in New Jersey. a treasure. Right. Anytime you want to know anything about women in politics, you go to the Center for American Women in Politics. We built, you and me, our generation, all of these various uh, institutions to help women to run. Now, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party had women's divisions, but they didn't always work the way they should have worked in the sense that, that if, if somebody came to you and said, well, this governor, he's really wonderful, and we'd love to support your women candidate, but the male candidate can win. This goes on in the Democratic Party, too. So what has happened is that the Republican Party, the party of Reagan, and then the two Bushes and Trump have not tried to encourage or back up or recruit women the way they should. So there is not enough Republican women in the legislatures, in the governorships, in the House, in the Senate. And I brought this because I wanted to read a few of these figures to show you the disintegration of the recruitment efforts by the Republican Party to bring women into the party. Mm. And as far as people are, of color are concerned, outside of some half-hearted efforts with Latinas in places like Texas and Florida, uh, they've done nothing there. They talk, they talk a good game, but they haven't done it. So the data is really, really interesting. For example, there were 43 new women elected to the House. 43 new women in the last election, 42 Democrats and one Republican. That's Amazing. terrible. Amazing. That is terrible. They didn't elect women in South Carolina to the House. I'm, I'm talking about they could mm -hmm. have elected because mm -hmm. they have not been recruiting women mm -hmm. or when they have tried, they, I'm talking about the Republican Party, mm -hmm. when they have tried to recruit, the Republican women don't want to run because they get very little mm -hmm. support from the National Party or the State Party. So then here's another one. In the Senate, there are 25 women. Do you know how many are Democrats and how many are Republicans? I'm trying to count the Republican women. I don't know. All right. There are 17 Democrats and there are eight, eight Republicans. Women. Now that is disgraceful in this time. 
But it, I'm not. I'm. I'm not even arguing. You know, yeah. where are the the conservative Demo uh, Republicans? Mm. So they don't agree with with my points of view. But why are they not recruiting yeah. these women? Right. Well, then we look at the governors. It's a little better, not much. There are only nine women governors in the country, six Democrats and three Republicans. And how many got elected this year? Do you know? I don't know. I don't I, know. I don't know if any, if any. Uh, Republican women, anyway. But, but, and then, <clears throat> the, the, this is where I get upset about my own state. We have never had a woman governor. We have never had a serious woman gubernatorial candidate. There's been talks about it. The tradition in New York, and you know this like I do, is when these very attractive Republican and Democratic women move up the, the political ladder Guess what they get to be? Lieutenant governors. <laughs> we have had 15 lieutenant Is that governors right? in the state. We have had <laughs> nine Democrats and six Republicans. And I, mm -hmm. That's amazing. <laughs> and, and the fact that we do not have a, a good, solid candidate to run for governor, we've got a couple years, mm -hmm. but... It's about time that New York have a, Repu a Republican or Democratic governor. Who's female. Female. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. Right. Do you consider yourself a Democrat or are you oh, I Oh, well, I will tell you what happened to me. <laughs> when I left the Republican Party, I became an independent. And I was on the independent rolls for years. And New Yorkers will say to you, well, if you're an independent, can't you vote can't in vote in the primaries. Well, I argued that I wanted to be able to say I was independent. And I don't remember what was the most horrendous thing the president did in the last six months. But around Christmas time, I happened to be down near Varick Street seeing my granddaughter who works in that neighborhood. And I was right in front of the Board of Elections. And I went in, and I am now a Democrat. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> and how does it feel? <laughs> It feels good because I'm now part of a big tribe mm. where I was kind of lost out there as an independent. What is, I'm glad and we welcome you, although I... Thank you. <laughs> the ERA, which is now being talked about more, um, has the Trump, admit, what the current Republican Party, do you know, has... Does oh, that, they, they are they against it. it. They are. Well, what they've done is that it's a non-issue. Uh, yes, there's there uh, there are some of Phyllis Schlafly's people out there, and uh, when you, you talk, let me just interrupt. And we don't have much time left, but even Phyllis Schlafly didn't get the recognition within the party as a woman until she was near the end of her life. Yeah. Oh yes, she's greatly admired. Uh, on the women's issue, if I were running the Republican Party nationally. I would try to get Nikki Haley to run, and then I would move Ralph, uh, uh, Mike Pence out, and I'd make Nikki Haley my vice president. Well, we'll see if that happens. <laughs> <laughs> but will you lose then other people? Or does she represent? We don't know, right? So you have given up all hope of a Republican Party. The Republican Party as it stands now. But there will be a new opposition force. There were some meetings among people just a little younger than me, all men that I heard about, to begin to put together a new Republican Party. They didn't call it that. And when I learned that there was no woman in the meeting and there was no person of color in the meeting. It was, again, the same old white guys. You know, they were <laughs> more reasonable. But the idea that in this day and age, with this thriving women's movement, that you would not, in trying to constitute a new party, include women, gives you some sense that yeah. it will come with the new generation, the millennial Republican women who aren't even in the party yet. Yeah. It will come. I do not know what the reaction will be. But at some point, there will be a thriving Republican Party, with women leading a lot of it. Are there any Republican women, any, that speak out now? Not right now, because nobody wants to be attacked by the president. And now, because it's 2020, 
everybody's behaving because you're getting into campaign mode. Well, now, as a Democrat, um, are you now watching the candidates? Of for, course. Are you <laughs> enthusiastically hoping for somebody? I'm not. I, I want a young person. Okay. I would love a young woman. And when I, I say young, I think that uh, Joy, Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders should gracefully do what I'm trying to do and be a uh, senior statesperson. I think the time has come for the new generation to take over in the Democratic Party, and it was, it's going to happen in the Republicans, too. Well, Tanya Mulish, thank you very much. I want to say that this book <laughs> is an exciting book to read. It really is. Good. Um, I couldn't put it down, actually, and it was the second time I was oh. reading it. And especially now, when you look at it from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested, read this book, The Republican War Against Women. And thank you so much, Tanya Mielisch. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie.